some important lessons about ourselves and about this magnificent universe we live in. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you a broader view of the glorious study of number. It begins with the compass. The first thing a compass does when you put it in the center is it produces a point. With the legs open you start a whirling motion and you produce a circle. That is one of the most important interesting symbols of the entire ancient world. It's a symbol of the sun to the Egyptians. It's a symbol of God. It's a symbol of the universe. It all begins with the infinitesimal point. Now what's so important about the point? Euclid has some things to teach us about a point that I believe is worth studying. Let's go to Euclid. Euclid's books on elements, books 1 through 13, it's, it's really easy to get. They've got the complete unabridged edition of all 13 books now. Barnes & Noble sells them in a paperback edition. It's the most important book to ever get to us from antiquity other than the scriptures. As far as a math or science book, there is nothing as magnificent as Euclid. What he says about the idea of what a point is, this one is edited, translated by Sir Thomas L. Heath. And it's a very excellent book. His first definition, definition number one in his elements, is on the point. He says, Simeon Esten Umeros Uthen. The Greek translates, a point is that which has no part. That's his first definition. A point is that which has no part. Now, the discussion on the point is extremely e interesting. He says, there's an exact parallel use of meteros esti. In the singular is found in Aristotle in his metaphysics, where he says there is a part, even of the form, Bonitz translates as if the plural were used. The meaning is simply, even the form is divisible into parts. And accordingly, it would be quite justifiable to translate, in this case, translating Euclid's idea, uh, Simeon Esten, Umedos Uthen, translated as, a point is that which is indivisible into parts. Now that's very interesting. Martianus Capella, he was from the 5th century A.D., alone and almost only translated differently, he says, a point is that a part of which is nothing. However, Euclid did not teach that a point itself is nothing. He said it is indivisible and it has no parts. The distinction is quite significant here. A monad having position. Now this is the Pythagorean exposition of a point. They call it a monad. It's not nothing, but it has position. It's something that has position, or with the position added. And a monad has, in every respect of magnitude and through magnitude, it has no position. They say Aristotle said, that is, that it is that which is similarly indivisible and has position. That is what a point is. Plato appears to have objected to that definition. But Aristotle's conception of a point as that which is indivisible and has position. Now this is interesting because it has no weight. It's not the point of a body. We can make no distinction between a point and the place. The Greek is topos, the place where the point is. It just is in a position. A point, he says, is like the now in time. Now is indivisible and is not part of time. It is only the beginning or the end or a division of time, but it is not part of it or 
of magnitude. It just now is, right now. It's only by motion that a point can generate a line, and that is precisely what the compass helps teach us. Once you make the point, when you begin the motion of whirling, now the Zohar has a beautiful exposition on the creation with God beginning his, his Gilgal, his whirlings. The universe was created from an infinitesimal point because of the whirlings. It always begins in a point, and it expands in a circle. The monad, the eye of God, the universe. Symbolically, when I drew that circle in the dirt with that compass, I created a universe, a uni-verse, a one song through the whirling of the motion into a perfect circle. This is some of the themes, the symbolisms, that you meditate on when you produce circles with a compass. That's one of the uh, lessons he says. And then he says, according to one Harundus, he defines a point as the indivisible beginning of all magnitudes, and Poseidonus is an extremity which has no dimension, or an extremity of a line. That's what a point is. Proclus says, the point is the only thing in the subject matter of geometry that is indivisible. And he says, he says, the problem is we define it using a negative, but we have no choice. The point and every division in a length or in a period of time, and that which is indivisible, is exhibited as privation. It, it's, it's not nothing, it's something, but you can't define it hardly except by position, because it's not, it's indivisible. <laughs> it's a very interesting subtle... A point is the beginning of the magnitudes, and that from which they grow. Now this is from An Nairizi. It is also the only thing which having position is not divisible. He, like Aristotle, adds that it's by its motion that a point can generate a magnitude. And, and, and I'm making a big deal about this because it's very significant in a philosophical state here once we begin studying the other aspects of geometry to see how the ancients put all this together and how it produces a world and our place in the world is utterly, exquisitely interesting. <laughs> At least it is to me. This is what makes me the backyard professor. When I go camping, I play in the dirt. Absolutely. Play. Life is not to be rushed through worrying about only one thing, money. There's a lot more to life than just money. When you meditate on eternal principles, eternal laws, and you doodle with them, all you have to do is take a stick and start doodling in the dirt. You discover fascinating things about truth in yourself and in the world. I promise. There's great power in meditating. I promise. So anyway, the main theme is as you get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and you take something down to an absolute point, the theme is the content of space vanishes, relative position remains. Point, then, according to our interpretation of Euclid, is the extremest limit of that which we can think of, not observe, as a spatial presentation. Oh, there's a neighbor. Hey, neighbors. It is a spatial presentation. And if we go further than that, not only does extension cease, but even relative place. And in this sense, in this sense, the part is nothing. But, the meaning which Simon intends to convey is better expressed by it has no part, rather than saying the part is nothing. Because it's not nothing. Since to take a part of a thing in Euclid's sense is a result of a simple division corresponding, of course, to the arithmetic division, this would not be to change the notion from that of the thing divided to an entirely different thing, however. So it's not nothing. 
and that's significant.